Um, so this is session one, Legion legionellosis you don't know how many times I practice that because it's a it's an interesting word in healthcare um, I want to introduce uh, our co-speakers from TDH Kelly Toby and Becky Meyer um, Kelly Toby has 13 years experience uh, focusing on infection prevention techniques to improve patient outcomes and staff safety. Um, she has a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing and a Master's in Public Health with a focus on community health education. Prior to working in public health, Kelly was an infection preventionist at an acute care hospital for two years. Um, her experience is an asset when working with facilities across the healthcare spectrum, and she's been a board certified um, board certified in infection control and epidemiology since 2014. She's an active member of the Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology and served on APIC Smoke, Smoky Mountain Chapter Board of Directors from 2010 to 2022. Rebecca Meyer is certified in infection control and epidemiology with a master's in public health since 2010. Um, her work history includes research assistant at the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, Georgia Division of Public Health as a public health worker, epidemiologist one and two. Um, after working for the Georgia Division of Public Health, Rebecca began working with the Tennessee Department of Health as an epidemiologist too. During this time, she assisted with many projects, including Get Smart for Antibiotics as project lead, lead development and coordination of statewide multidisciplinary advisory group on antibiotic stewardship. Um, and then Rebecca transitioned as an epidemiologist for Knox County Health Department. Currently, Rebecca is an infection prevention specialist one for the Tennessee Department of Health, in which she continues to provide infection prevention and control guidance um, on COVID-19, MRSA, monkeypox, Legionella, and MDROs. Uh, please help me welcome both Kelly and Rebecca. Good afternoon. Thanks for attending our session. Um, thank you to the QSORS team for having us and also for you guys to attend because if you're not already aware, Legionella is becoming more and more prevalent in healthcare settings. So a little bit about our HAI team. We're the Healthcare Associated Infections and Antimicrobial Resistance Program um, with the Health Department. We are consultative and non-regulatory. And as you're probably well aware, um, during COVID pandemic, infection prevention um, was much more relevant. So in response to that, we grew our um, statewide infection prevention specialist network starting in 2021, and we've grown to 16 team members. When I started, we were an IP team of three. So we are now strategically um, placed across the street so we can be rapidly deployed to your healthcare um, facility for our consults and assessments. We're a multidisciplinary, diverse group with a wide um, area of expertise and backgrounds. So we have over 300 years of nursing experience, nearly 200 years of IP experience. <coughs> Um, 12 of our team members are board certified in infection control and two of those team members are also certified for long-term care facility infection control. So you can see all the different areas that we have worked in. So we bring that subject matter expertise to your facilities. We serve any, really any licensed type of facility, but especially during COVID in the past few years, we have really been uh, actively engaged in the nursing home and the long-term care facilities. But we also go into public health clinics, acute care hospitals, and outpatient clinics as well, um, like surgery centers, doctor's offices, dental offices, podiatry offices, they all need some more IP resources. Again, we're consultative, non-regulatory. When we come in, we can be brought in because either you may have a new IP in your facility and they need some um, oversight into what they need to focus on. You may also be having an outbreak and reach out to us and ask us to come and assist you. Um, tools that we use vary, but they're usually from the CDC. They have an ICAR tool, and that stands for Infection Control Assessment and Response. We use those tools. There's one specific to COVID, but there's also ones for all facility types. 
We also have a slimmed down version of that tool, which we call a rapid response consult. We can do that virtually or in person, and it focuses on the issue that is, that is at hand or your need at your facility. So we can kind of uh, go in, help you with what you need, but also not spend a whole day or several hours there if you don't have that time to give to us. So now a little bit about Legionella. There's 52 uh, Legionella bacteria species. Um, this is a picture of one of those, and the one that causes the majority of human illness is Legionella pneumophilia serogroup 1. So the bacteria live naturally in, in the environment and can be found in lakes, rivers, streams, and soils. Um, however, Legionella in the, in the environment rarely causes illness in humans. The danger arises when the Legionella enters your building water management or water system and multiply when ideal conditions are present. So this is an image of uh, some pipes in a water in a building in a facility. And if you're thinking, isn't the water treated before it gets into your facility? And Shouldn't it be pathogen free? The answer is yes and no. Yes, the water is treated, and that's through a process called um, secondary disinfection, where they add a disinfectant to it, but that does not remove all the um, pathogens in the microorganisms that are in the water system itself. And once introduced into your system, those uh, microorganisms can multiply. And then that lower picture shows a cross section of a pipe. Um, so the blue at the, at the top where it has free floating bacteria in the water, and then the bottom part of the image shows some biofilm or some slime that li lines um, your pipes and can cause those organisms to continue to grow. So Legionella can infect a person when a contaminated device or the water system with the respiratory particles um, aerosolized either through cooling towers, showers, hot tubs, fountains, or any other um, device that uses water in your um, setting, such as BiPAP machines, CPAP, things like that. People get sick when they breathe in those small particles um, into their lungs, and it's especially the most at risk are the elderly, people above 50, and then also people with um, compromised, immune compromised conditions and a history of lung issues such as current or previous smokers. So additional routes of transmission in healthcare settings are, are shown in this picture. Splashes from sinks or drains, uh, preparing injections or medications near a sink. There's actually a two-foot um, splash zone, and they can cause contamination. Improper oral care in immunocompromised patients or using poor quality water. Let's say that you have an ice machine that's not disinfected regularly. You could get organisms in that and giving your patients or your residents um, water from that contaminated ice machine could also make them sick. So when Legionella bacteria are inhaled into the lungs, they can cause illness, especially in susceptible people. And the most common illness is Legionella disease. And Legionnaire's disease is a severe pneumonia that's characterized by fever and respiratory symptoms uh, and an abnormal chest X-ray. The incubation period for Legionnaire's disease is generally two to 14 days, and the case fatality rate is about 10%. But for those living in healthcare settings, um, the case fatality rate increases. So, healthcare facilities are at high risk of um, growth and spread of Legionella because they have a large, complex water system where the bacteria can grow to high numbers without you knowing it if you're not monitoring it. These settings also serve a more vulnerable population, which um, can, uh, increases the risk of these people um, having severe outcomes and a higher mortality rate. So we're gonna do a few knowledge checks during our presentation. So the first one is the optimal temperature growth for Legionella growth is 
which of the following? Sorry, I, I clicked twice and I gave it away. But the answer is 77 to 113 degrees. So at temperatures outside of that optimal range, the Legionella would generally be killed. And at temperatures below that range, the Legionella can become dormant until the water temperature reaches that optimal range again and starts multiplying. So during 2022, in addition to the COVID pandemic, uh, there was also a number of outbreak investigations that were conducted across the U.S. and in other countries. New York investigated a large nursing home outbreak that resulted in the death of four residents. Outbreaks like this result in a high case fatality rate and also highlight the importance of having a Legionella prevention program in your healthcare facilities. Because of the risk of growth and spread of Legionella in healthcare settings, the public health um, generally conduct surveillance to determine if cases have been um, exposed in a healthcare setting. We do this by looking at the incubation period or the 14 day period prior to illness onset to see if those um, patients or residents were in a healthcare setting. Um, so what we define as a possible healthcare associated case is if the patient spent any portion of that 14 day period in a healthcare setting. We consider them a presumptive healthcare associated case if they spent more than 10 days in a healthcare setting because we presume the illness caused was caused by, by being in that facility. When two or more people with Legionnaire's disease are exposed in a, a, a very small period of time or within the same facility, we consider that a cluster or an outbreak. So how common are these healthcare associated cases? The chart on the left shows the total number of Legionnaire disease cases from 2011 through 2021 in the state of Tennessee. Um, Tennessee generally sees about 150 to 200 cases per year. The gray bars indicate um, that either the, uh, the patient was not in a healthcare setting or they were not interviewed. The blue bars show where they were presumptive uh, or possible cases because they were, they spent part of that period in the healthcare setting. And the red indicates that the cases were presumptive cases because they were in a healthcare setting for a period of that time. And then the a little um, image on the right shows the tentative cases for 2021, and there's always some lag, um, 2022, there's always some lag time in reporting and defining cases. So you can see that um, there was an increased number of cases in 2022, and we're continuing to see an increase in cases in 2023, and we're not really sure of the full cause of that yet. So next, Becky's going to come and talk to you about your water management plans, regulations, and some other helpful resources. All right. I don't know about you all, but I'm freezing to death, so I'm glad I got to stand up. Um, anyway, like Kelly said, I get to talk about the fun stuff. Um, some of it's a little dense, but it is interesting. So let me see, clicker, there we go. Um, so as far as water management plans, a water management program can take many forms. It can look like the giant binders on the left. Um, it can be stored in a software program like you see on the right. By definition, um, water management plans identify hazardous conditions and take steps to minimize the growth and transmission of Legionella and other waterborne pathogens in the building water system. These plans require continuous review and are now an industry standard for many buildings in the United States. Water management plans are put into place to prevent disease and keep residents healthy. Um, here we go. Sorry, y'all, I'm just messing with this script thing. Here we go. Okay, so there are seven steps described by CDC when developing a water management plan. 
One, establish a team to lead the water management program. This typically includes a medical director, administrator, IP, uh, environmental services, or maintenance staff. Number two, make a diagram of the building water flow. Describe the building water systems and how water is processed and used. Number three, identify where Legionella could grow or spread. Examples, stagna stagnation prone areas, temperatures favorable to Legionella in your building. Um, number four, decide where control measures should be added in your water system. Number five, develop a plan for responding to water uh, results that are outside of the control limits, like the temperature is not high enough, there's low, disinfect uh, low disinfection or chlorine levels, and how to intervene when things go wrong. Number six, make sure that your plan is working and make sure that you make those changes when it's needed. Number seven, document and maintain records. It's vital for communications related to the program, and I know that people are getting asked by surveyors um, to see the water management plan, to see the monitoring of the control measures. Um, so this image is from a vital signs report put out by CDC. Uh, they reviewed data from recent outbreaks and found that 90% of outbreaks could have been prevented with effective water management. Water management programs help reduce process failures, human error, equipment issues, and changes in water quality. So here's our first knowledge check. I love this one. Uh, which of these devices do not pose a risk for Legionella growth? The answer is electric AC units. The reason for that, these are your wall units, the units that are in windows. Um, they don't have water flowing through them, like a, a, a cooling tower on top of a building, so they're not a risk. And you will notice that I did not highlight E. CDC actually has a whole page, which another thing to freak out about. I know, thank you, CDC. But it has a whole page on the dangers of, and I've done it, taking straight water and putting it in the windshield washer fluid <laughs> reservoir in your car, um, but it's a danger for long haul truck drivers. That's the biggest concern. So when local health calls a case of Legionella, they do ask for a profession. They ask if you drive a semi truck um, and they ask about pressure washing and things like that for that reason. Um, so this is a list of all those devices that are risky. These are all listed in ASHRAE's guideline 12 as having the potential to grow Legionella. Um, additionally, if low, low flow fixtures and flow restriction devices are used in your facility, um, manual or automated flushing of these devices should occur. Uh, and if you need guidance on this, see either manufacturer's instructions for use, if you can find them, or CDC's environmental guidance. And a word about outbreaks, CDC refers to them as creeping outbreaks, as you may not have a huge amount of cases at the same time, but sporadic cases popping up, so you may not have five residents with um, you know, confirmed Legionella, you may have one here or there when conditions are right and that resident inhales that Legionella bacteria. So it may not be as obvious, which is why they call it a creeping outbreak. Um, therefore, each healthcare associated case is treated as an opportunity to review the water management plan and respond with testing and remediation if it's deemed necessary. So when you have an outbreak investigation, these are the groups that are involved. You have local public health, environmental health. Those are the people with the really cool expensive machines that can come out and test your water, take samples. The Waterborne Program is a group of epidemiologists in Nashville that focus specifically on waterborne pathogens and infection prevention specialists. I think I've gone out to three or four of these in the last year. Um, we don't focus on the epi side of things. We kind of break off and work with the DUN or the IP and talk about respiratory therapy equipment, may ask questions about water management, but we kind of stick to that IP focus when we're out. We um, stay in our lanes and divide and conquer. So um, sampling is done to check disinfectant levels, pH and temperature. Like I said, they bring their fancy machine with them and test it right on site. Um, samples are also taken for processing at the state lab to check for presence of Legionella by both culture and PCR. That PCR is gonna tell you if there is Legionella present, but it's not gonna tell you if it's viable or not. So it's kind of a preliminary result, um, but good to know if it is in your system. Culture is gonna tell you if it is a viable growing organism that you have, but that um, can take a while. So a Legionella culture, it's one of those slow growers and it can take up to two weeks before those final results um, are returned. So if you do work on one of these outbreaks, that is just something to keep in mind that it may be 
um, two weeks before you get those results back. Not that we're ignoring you or not responding to emails or whatever. Um, another word about remediation. Um, so hold on a second. All right. I'm just going to read this. Even when successful, remedial treatment is only a temporary measure. Recolonization is very likely to occur unless the underlying reasons for Legionella colonization are addressed. So if you have a case of Legionella, somebody comes out, you do a temperature or a chemical shock, it's not addressing the root cause. It didn't address why that bacteria proliferated in the first place. Um, so you may do that shock, but then you need to talk about, okay, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? Um, why did we have an issue in the first place? So what does remediation entail? One moment. Hold on, sorry. There we go. It froze up on me. Here we go. Two options for remediation are chemical and thermal shock. Characteristics of the building and its system are used to determine best approach. Inappropriate selection may be ineffective, harmful to, harmful to building occupants, and may be damaging to building piping and to building water system components. So um, things to remember about this, again, um, you'd want to get a professional remediation company because chemical Chemical shock, depending on what type of pipes you have, can cause chemical leaching. You don't want that stuff in your water. Thermal shock actually has become an issue to the point where ASHRAE has updated their guideline 12, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, people were going to um, thermal shock, turn up the water as hot as it'll go, do a hot water shock, and <coughs> melting gaskets and their piping system. Um, which was apparently a much more expensive thing to fix. So there is new language in that guide. So regulation and standards, everyone's favorite. Um, to assist in the prevention of Legionella and ensure patient safety, CMS released a memo in 2017 requiring facilities to add Legionella prevention activities to their facility management. This requirement applies to hospitals, critical access hospitals, and you all, long-term care facilities. In 2018, CMS added additional clarity to require the requirement to highlight the necessary components of Legionella prevention. The requirements include conducting a facility risk assessment, developing and implementing a water management program, developing of a protocol for testing water parameters, setting control ranges and creating a plan for responding to limits that are outside of those control limits. Um, an additional note here, and I think I make this again later, uh, CMS does not currently require water cultures or microbial testing. Um, so that's not required. It is very useful. I've had long conversations with industrial hygienists about this, um, but do not fear that a surveyor will tell you that that is something that's required. So this picture here is from the state, ten the Tennessee State Operations Manual. Um, and again, this thing gets wonky and freezes. There we go. Um, so this was added in February 2023. So just this year, this red font was added to the state operations manual. Um, I'm hoping you're all aware of that. But the three elements added um, in writing now are that facilities need to conduct a risk assessment, they need to have control measures, and they need to know how to monitor the control measures. And all of that needs to be written in a water management plan. Um, and again, in this verbiage, it's noted that routine cultures for pathogens are not required. But during an outbreak, we may suggest doing that. Here is a list of questions you should anticipate from surveyors. These were all taken from an actual F880 tag um, conducted a, at a facility. So number one, does this facility have a water management program? If yes, can we see a copy? Has the facility done a risk assessment? If so, what were the results? What are your control measures? And finally, how do you monitor them? And what is the plan if they're not in range? So here's what the findings were for that F880 tag. Um, and these are actual findings from a document. Uh, there were no records to show when the water management plan was last reviewed. So you definitely want to have a revision date and review it annually is the recommendation at minimum. Uh, the water management plan did not include a risk assessment. There were no records of any control measures being followed. So the records of the pH, chlorine levels, temperature, make sure you're documenting all that and saving it. Um, the surveyor is going to ask to see it. 
And surveyors interviewed staff to assess familiarity with the water management plan, the facility policy, and Legionella prevention. Um, they didn't just ask the DON. They didn't just ask the IP. They were asking everyone. It was in the F-880 tag. They asked the administrator. So, um, again, you want to have all those people as part of your water management program, and they all need to know answers to these questions. Um, as an epidemiologist, I couldn't uh, help but put data in this thing, so apologies. So now we'll review some data from the NHSN. Um, this is the annual facility survey that you all may fill out. The first question, does, does your facility have a water management program to prevent the growth and transmission of Legionella? 97% uh, yes, that was an easy one. Have you ever conducted a facility risk assessment? 83% responded yes, so still pretty good. Um, and here's a question, who is represented on the water uh, management program team at your facility. So here's where we get a little dicey. Infection preventionist, 60% said yes. Facilities manager and engineer, 32 only said yes. Maintenance staff, 82%. And I realize that depending on the title of that person in your facility, that may have made the results a little wonky. But ideally, all these people should be involved is the moral of this slide. So we'll move on. Um, do you regularly monitor blank in your building's water system. So 58% said yes, they monitor disinfectant levels, 45 heterotrophic plate counts, and that's your microbial testing. You're not specifically testing for Legionella, but you are testing for um, a bacterial plate count that's going to tell you how much stuff bacteria is in your water. Um, and specific tests, I don't know what that means, but that's how CDC words it. Specific tests, 78% are doing that. Um, and temperature, 94%. That's the most common is usually a temperature, pH, and chlorine. The next few slides provide links to guidelines and toolkits. The first is ANSI ASHRAE Standard 188, Legionellosis, Risk Management for Building Water Symptoms. This is a standard that establishes minimum risk uh, management requirements for buildings with complex water systems. Standards are generally incorporated into building codes over time. This one really leads, uh, reads like legal jargon. Um, we'll get to something more helpful in a second. <laughs> uh, and this toolkit from CDC is intended to be an easy to understand interpretation of that last document that's pretty difficult to understand. Um, the toolkit includes a simple yes, no worksheet to determine if an entire building or parts of it are uh, increased risk, a basic review of the elements of a Legionella water management program, scenarios describing common water quality pr uh, problems, and special sections and considerations for those who work in healthcare facilities. So this is the more helpful guide. Um, I really love this document. That sounds really nerdy, but it actually is in easy to understand human language. It doesn't read like legal jargon. So I highly recommend it if you want to get a good basic understanding of this stuff. And I will tell you that um, this has been updated since I sent in these slides. There is an ASHRAE guideline 12 2023 that just came out within the last couple of weeks. And it does speak to the um, recommendation about thermal shocking and the fact that people have been melting all kinds of things. So I haven't gotten to read it yet, but it does, um, there is an update and it does give additional guidance on when to actually heat things up and how to avoid melting your building. Um, and a reminder uh, from our, our waterborne team, there are a ton of free resources available to assist you with creating and update, uh, updating your water management plan. Um, TDH put on a webinar series with THA that covers how to create a water management plan or program specifically for facilities in Tennessee. Um, that's available online. CDC also has a free prevent Legionella training that covers how to develop a water management plan. And CDC also has a toolkit that walks through how to create a water management plan. And you can always reach out to the central office Legionella team or Kelly and I in the HAI inbox uh, with any questions you may have about this stuff. So another knowledge check. The following are all Legionella control measures, except obviously it's a trick question. Okay. Um, I don't know where that second slide went. G is the answer. It's, they're all. You can pick any of those. Got a slide missing. That's okay. Um, as mentioned by ASHRAE guideline 12, respiratory therapy equipment that has been filled or rinsed with tap water, um, that has been associated with outbreaks of Legionnaires disease in healthcare facilities. 
and at home. So again, as a local, I used to be an epidemiologist, we would always ask, you know, are you a smoker? Or do you drive that big truck? But also, um, do you use a CPAP? Does it have a humidifier? What are you doing? <laughs> How are you, oh, look at that. I just got a little, a little backwards there. Okay. Um, so one of our major recommendations is to thoroughly review users' manuals. Um, sometimes when I go into a long-term care, they can't find the, uh, the IFUs, which is pretty common. Some of that stuff has been around for a while in your building. Um, a lot of the stuff you can find online, if you can't, reach out to us. I'm happy to help. Um, I helped a facility find some instructions for use just so they could double check what they were doing, how often they were disinfecting things, what they were using to disinfect, um, and just uh, make sure they were doing that correctly. Um, and so here's an example of an observation that I've made in a, another facility. It was for an oxygen concentrator. Um, there was unclear assigning of responsibility for cleaning and disinfection. The facility's process of weekly maintenance was not per the IFUs. Uh, the IFUs stated <coughs> daily cleaning and disinfection for that device. Um, and it was being done weekly. So we just made the recommendation to follow the IFUs. We just pointed out what those were after I found them on the internet because the facility did not have them. Um, and a rhetorical question for you, do you know which equipment is assigned to which resident in case there is to be an investigation? Meaning if you had a case of legionellosis in your building and you knew they had been using an oxygen concentrator, are you documenting which piece of equipment they're using so you can go and maybe run a disinfection on that unit, just something to think about. Um, and here is, let's see. Okay, so again, we talk about finding the IFUs. Uh, WHO does have this document as well. If you can't find the um, IFUs, this does speak to disinfection. It actually is a pretty nice document. Um, during COVID, treatments shifted between nebulizer treatments and other routes of administration. Um, I'm sure you all remembered we were supposed to avoid aerosol generating procedures at all costs, right? So a lot of technologies were used um, that were different than the norm. Um, so unfamiliarity with new equipment and its IFUs may lead to outbreaks. High demand for these treatments could contribute to risk, let's say if the uh, nebulizer had been rinsed with tap water and didn't fully dry prior to use. Um, that's just a a journal article about that issue. So ensure staff use correct water for cleaning and disinfection per the manufacturer's IFU. Make sure it is completely dry to avoid aerosolizing any leftover rinse water. Um, so a lot of these are going to recommend cleaning with sterile water rather than tap water anyway. But if it is rinsed with tap water ever, making sure that it dries. And again, away from the sink, um, a lot of this equipment can sometimes just be put rinsed and put right next to the sink, so it may dry out for a second, but then if it's within the splash zone, it's going to get contaminated. Um, so just keeping an uh, eye on that, being mindful of how close it is to the sink. Knowledge check. Yay. Um, when determining proper cleaning and disinfection procedures for a piece of respiratory equipment, good practice is to first ask a coworker, check IFUs, make an educated guess, Google it. Uh, which, uh, yeah, um, yeah, check the eye view, right? Um, and again, if you can't find it because the stuff goes missing, I can't find instructions for things in my own house. Uh, a lot of them you can find now on the interwebs. Um, and if you can't, let us know. Um, I've helped facilities with that also. So summary and wrap up, y'all, we're doing really well on time. Um, summaries and major takeaways from this. One, create a water management plan and program. That's required now. Um, conduct an annual risk assessment. Also required, if you're unsure how to do this, um, there are plenty of templates, forms. I mean, some of this can be done in a checklist format. Um, let us know if you need any assistance. Clinical testing for sick residents. So a lot of times when we go out on Legionella outbreak visits, um, it isn't standard practice when somebody has a respiratory infection to test them for Legionella because everything is COVID now. But just remember that other things besides COVID exist. You all know that. But, you know, being an advocate um, when it comes to testing and saying, hey, are we testing for everything we need to? Do we have the capacity or a lab identified that can test for Legionella? Can we add this to the differential? Um, 
would be wonderful. And then educating staff about respiratory therapy equipment, cleaning and disinfection, making sure that people are following the IFUs, making sure they're using the sterile water if they need to, making sure if it is a nebulizer that's rinsed out, making sure it's completely dry so no um, droplets get aerosolized. And that's it. So like I said, if you guys have questions about this, if you want assistance with getting some of this stuff started, you can always reach out to us um, at that inbox. That's all I have. I'm going to open it up. Does anyone have any questions at all? Are y'all going to send those slides to us? Yes, I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, a few things that I did want to ask, so I'm going to... I'm going to have you step back up here. Okay. Um, so we had a few that we kind of populated ourselves. Yeah. Um, okay. How often should control measures like temp, chlorine, uh, micro be monitored? Yeah. So I get this question a lot. And to be honest, it's really vague in the um, guidelines. Basically, you're deciding that for yourself. So there's no standard or regulatory document that says you have to test every other week. You have to test monthly. It's up to your facility to write it into a policy, decide what you can do or what you want to do and follow it okay i know <laughs> so should they be testing res residents for legionella if they just have a cough or like is there something more specific or do you think it should be standardized yeah so um uh just like i said i think it's an uh not being tested for as often as it should be and often when we go out to facilities they're not doing that testing mm -hmm. so i think there may be some cases that aren't identified for that reason so i think talking you know at your facilities about what you're testing for, when you're testing for Legionella, if you have that capacity, definitely look into that and start considering testing because it definitely is not tested for um, as often as it should be. Yeah, my so. first thought with a cough wouldn't be to test for Legionella, but right. good thought. So. Yeah. Okay. So, oh. With that, when you're testing for that with a culture, it would be with a sputum culture, correct? So you can do culture with a sputum, but they actually have a Legionella antigen urine test. So most of the test results I've seen on the epi side were all Legionella antigen uh, in urine. Sorry. Okay. So um, having a conversation about if that's possible, if you can send off a urine specimen, that probably would be easiest. That's typically what they do. Yeah, yeah, it is. There's all kinds of issues with that, but definitely the Legionella antigen in urine is probably... Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. So, okay. Anybody else? No. Thank you. Thank both Thank of you. you and <laughs> okay, so we're gonna have a 15 minute break, and really, you guys are gonna get. <laughs> 30 to 45 minute break, which is totally fine. Um, if you guys want to return to the room over there, there should be snacks and drinks, okay? And our next session starts at 2.15.